This is Dr. Hayek, and this video is about the energies of solution formation. I will start this video by discussing the factors that affect solubility. To simplify this discussion, we will assume that the formation of a liquid solution takes place in three different steps. Step 1. Separating the solute into its individual components, and we call this expanding the solute. Step 2. Overcoming intermolecular interactions in the solvent to make room for the solute particles. And this is called expanding the solvent. In step 3, allowing the solute and solvent particles to mix to form the solution. Let's take a look at the particulate level and discuss the energies involved in this process. In step 1, energy is needed to break the intermolecular interactions between the solute particles, and therefore, since energy is needed, this process is going to be an endothermic process. In a similar way, energy is needed to break the intermolecular interactions between the solvent particles, and this process is also an endothermic process. In step 3, the solute and solvent particles will mix to form the solution, and therefore, energy will be released due to the formation of the intermolecular interactions between the solute and the solvent particles. So this process is going to be an exothermic process. Now what about the heat of the solution? The heat of the solution can be calculated then by the sum of the energies involved in these three steps. So delta H solution is equal to delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. The heat of the solution may have a negative sign or a positive sign. Now let's take a look on the energy diagram where the potential energy of the separated solute and solvent is represented. Now as we know, energy is required to expand their particles, and this energy is equal to delta H1 plus delta H2. When the solution forms, energy is going to be released. In this example, the energy released is greater than the sum of delta H1 plus delta H2. In this case, the sign of the delta H solution is going to be negative, and therefore, delta H solution is negative, and the solution is favored to form. Let's consider another example now, where in a similar way, the energy of the separated solute and solvent is represented, and energy is needed to expand their particles. So now, if the energy released when the solution forms is less than the sum of delta H1 plus delta H2, so the sign of the delta H solution is going to be positive, and the solution may or may not form. I will explain this in the upcoming part. Let's consider the example of oil and water and discuss why oil and water don't mix. An example to this, when an oil tanker leaks and forms an oil layer on top of water, which is eventually is going to be carried out onto the beaches. Now, oil is a nonpolar substance, and the only intermolecular interactions allowed are London dispersion force. In the case of oil molecules, since oil molecules are large and they have a large surface area, the London dispersion forces are going to be strong, and more energy is required to break them, so delta H1 is going to be large positive. Water is a polar molecule, and water molecules are bound together by H bonding. Now, H bonding is considered as a strong interactions, and therefore, more energy is required to break them, and delta H2 is going to be a large positive. When water and oil mix, the only interactions between water and oil is London dispersion force, and this interaction is going to be weak due to the small size of water molecules. So in this case, we say there is a little to none energy released, and in this case, delta H3 is almost zero. So the delta H solution resulting is going to be a large positive, and the solution is not going to be favored to form. Now what about when the delta H solution is a small positive, which is the case of sodium chloride solution, would the solution form or not? Let's see this example. To break the sodium chloride solid into its ions, 786 kilojoule per mole are needed, and this is going to be delta H1. Now it's important to note that delta H1 is the opposite of the lattice energy, which is the energy required 
when salts form from their individual ions at the gaseous state. Now, when these ions mix with water, 783 kilojoule per mole is going to be released, and this is called the delta H hydration. So now, delta H1 is the energy needed to expand the solute particles, or in this case, breaking the ionic bond. Delta H hydration is called heat of hydration, which is equal to delta H2 plus delta H3, where delta H2 is the energy needed to expand the solvent particles, or in this case, breaking the H bonding. And delta H3 is the energy released when the ions are mixed with water. In this case, large amount of energy is going to be released since the interaction between ions and water is considered to be very strong interaction. Now to calculate the delta H solution, we can sum delta H1 plus delta H hydration, and the sum is going to be equal to positive 3 kilojoule per mole. So as you can see, the sign of the delta H solution is positive. We all know that sodium chloride is very well soluble in water, so how can we explain this? To answer this question, I will need to define entropy, which is the degree of randomness or disorder in the system. Now we can say things tend to be messier, and nature will favor the states with high probability. Consider the example of equal number of orange and yellow spheres in a box separated by a partition. If the partition is removed, the spheres will mix. There will be no number of times that we can shake this box and get the spheres to separate again to go back to the original case. Now, this is because nature will always favor these states with high probability, which is when these spheres are mixed together. If we apply this to the sodium chloride solution, even though the solution formation is not favored in terms of enthalpy, however, it's going to be favored thanks to the increase in its entropy. This is only true when the heat of the solution is small positive, because processes that require large amount of energy tend not to occur. Having explained this, now we have a better understanding of the expression like dissolves like. We must use a polar solvent to dissolve a polar or ionic solute, and a nonpolar solvent to dissolve a nonpolar solute. How can we explain this in terms of energy? In the case of a polar solute and a polar solvent, now both substances have strong intermolecular interactions between their particles. And therefore, to expand their particles, we will need more energy. And in this case, delta H1 and delta H2 will both be large positive. When the solute and solvent are mixed together, the strong intermolecular interactions will form, and therefore, a lot of energy will be released, and delta H3 will be large negative. Now, delta H solution in this case, it's going to be small. Now, whether it's a small negative or small positive, according to what we explained previously, the solution still forms. Now, in the case of a nonpolar solute and a polar solvent, the interactions within the nonpolar solute are weak, so that's why delta H1 is small, but the interactions between the polar solvent's particles are strong. So that's why delta H2 is large positive. Now the interaction between nonpolar solute and a polar solvent is going to be weak and therefore delta H3 is going to be small. Now in this case, the delta H solution is going to be large positive thanks to the delta H2 term. So in this case, the solution will not form. In the case of a nonpolar solute and nonpolar solvent, all interactions within the solute and the solvent are weak and therefore delta H1 and delta H2 will be small. Now the interaction that will form between the solute and the solvent are also going to be weak and therefore small amount of energy will be released. But in this case the delta H solution will be small and whether it's a small negative or small positive, 
the solution still forms. In the last case scenario where we have a polar solute and a nonpolar solvent, so delta H1 is going to be large positive because of the strong interactions within the solute particles. Now delta H2 is going to be small because of the weak intermolecular interactions within the nonpolar solvent. And delta H3 is going to be small because the only allowed intermolecular interactions between the polar solute and nonpolar solvent are London dispersion force, which will release small amount of energy. So the delta H solution in this case is going to be large positive thanks to the delta H1 term. And in this case, the solution cannot form. So having explained this, I hope you better understand now the expression like dissolves like. I hope this video was helpful to you, so please like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you next time.